Welcome to class 19 on topics in power electronics and distributed generation. In this class, we will look at a, a couple of examples. Uh, these are homework uh, problems for the students in class. Uh, we will look at one, one problem on uh, grounding and a second problem on uh, distribution system equipment uh, protection and coordination. Okay. So, in the first problem we have a secondary distribution system which is essentially at the uh, consumption uh, point essentially 415 volts uh, distribution of length 1 kilometer and we have a couple of uh, major loads on this dis uh, distribution which is uh, load 1 and load 2 and uh, the source is a delta y transformer with the y point uh, solidly grounded and uh, uh, each grounding is uh, with uh, is a solidly uh, grounded but the ground resistance to deep earth is about uh, 4 ohms which is essentially the resistance between the earth electrode and the soil to deep earth and you have parasitic capacitance uh, to ground for the, 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 the lines and that is uh, 2 microfarads per kilometer and uh, you have a DG now connected at uh, load 2 potentially it could be for providing power or for power quality reasons you have added a DG and that is grounded through a resistor RDG. So, if you look at this particular uh, example, this is essentially if you ignore the DG for now, this is essentially a TT distribution uh, secondary distribution where uh, the source is uh, grounded directly to terra earth and each load has its own uh, grounding electrode. Uh, and load 1 and load 2 is uh, connected, uh, the earth, uh, the ground wires are connected to earth. Okay. But if you look at the DG, the DG is connected at load 2 with a resistance. So, overall you can see that this is a, a system which has both TT aspects to it and also high resistance grounding aspect to it. So, in a, a actual system, it is actually possible to have multiple grounding options present in the same system uh, depending on what exactly your objectives are. Okay. So, the first problem is uh, to look at uh, what happens if you have a single line to ground fault in load 1 and uh, what is the resulting fault current seen at uh, circuit breaker 1 and circuit breaker 3 uh, through which the DG is interconnected and you want to see whether there is any increase in fault current uh, due to the addition of the DG. So, if you look at uh, uh, this problem, you have the system parameters So, you have uh, the source which is uh, 1 MVA uh, 415 volt. So, it is base impedance would be Uh, 172 milli ohms and we are told that the leakage inductance of the transformer is 4 percent. So, this corresponds to uh, 0 0.04 into 1.722 or uh, 6.89 uh, milli ohms. So, about 7 milli ohms uh, is the impedance from the uh, reactance of the transformer. If you look at the DG, the Z base for the DG is, it is a 200 
KVA DG. So, it is uh, base uh, resistance is uh, base impedance is 0.86 ohms and you have the effective uh, leakage of the DG uh, being about 10 percent. So, that corresponds to 86 milli ohms. So, next we could look at the case for, for the first case we will look at the situation when there is no DG connected. So, if you have a single line to ground fault, your equivalent uh, sequence network would be and your, uh, your source is grounded through uh, uh, and you have the earth impedance coming in between which is 4 ohms. So, 3 times 4, uh, four would be 12 ohms seen from the source side and, and when you have a fault. Uh, occurring within load 1, essentially the path for the cur uh, fault current is through this electrode, through the system out into load 1, uh, into the frame of uh, load 1 uh, connected through the ground uh, grounding wires into the ground electrode. That would also have a 4 ohm uh, re uh, resistance, equivalent grounding resistance. So, So, you could calculate your fault current we are neglecting the 7 milli ohms which is much lesser than the 12 ohms. So, you have a fault current of about uh, 30 amps. So, the uh, next uh, case is when you have the, the DG also connected. So, when you have the DG connected, you now have your sequence network which would have two sources, one is your, your original source. and you have the DG And if you look at the zero sequence network, you have and you have the grounding resistance of the DG, which is uh, uh, 1500 ohms. So, in your sequence network, you would have 3 times that which is 4500 ohms plus the grounding uh, resistance of 12 ohms. Twelve ohms at uh, load 1 
and you have 12 uh, 3 uh, 4 ohms at the source which shows up as 12 ohms equivalent and you have I f by 3 flowing through the circuit and again you can see that uh, the milli ohms can be neglected compared to the 12 ohms and 4500 ohms. So, I f by 3 So, it is the parallel combination of these two uh, resistance circuits. So, you get I f equal to 30.04 amps, which means that the increase in current seen because of the DG, uh, increase in fault current seen because of the DG is about 40 uh, milliamps. So, you can see uh, or say that there is hardly uh, almost no change in the current level because now you have added the DG for a single line to ground fault. So, the question is to uh, figure out what is the current seen by breaker 1 and uh, uh, 3 and so to calculate that we will have to look at your uh, uh, sequence quantities. So, if you look at uh, your your current flowing through the through the circuit you have uh, this would be I A S 1 in circuit breaker 1 and this would be your I A in circuit breaker 3. So, similarly you can find the sequence sequence currents in the branches of uh, this particular circuit. So, you have the overall current. So, you have to find out how the current splits between these two branches. So, you could find out the, the share of current for the positive sequence, negative sequence and zero sequence. Uh, so, you could do that calculation. So, you get uh, I A S 1 positive sequence through breaker 1 is 0.0. So, here you have uh, uh, two parallel reactants of 86 milli ohms and 7 milli ohms. So, that the breakup would be uh, 9.26 amps. Uh, I A negative through C B 1 would be the same uh, a similar calculation you will get 9.26 amps. I A 0 sequence through C B 1 would be uh, so in case of the split over here again 12 ohms and uh, 4512 uh, 4, ohms is uh, much larger than the 7 and 86. So, you could take your current split as so you can then calculate your I A S 1 by going from the sequence to phase transformation. So, it is I A plus plus I A minus plus I A 0. So, this is 28.5 amps flowing through uh, phase A of uh, circuit breaker 1. So, to calculate uh, uh, the, the current flowing through phase A of uh, circuit breaker 3, you have
So, if you then calculate what your I A through C B 3 is, this is the sum of these 3 currents. So, you have about 1.5 1. 1. amps uh, flowing through uh, the circuit. So, at this point uh, you have calculated what would be the current flowing through C B 1 and C B 3 because of a fault in uh, uh, load L 1. So, the next problem is uh, to see what would be the touch potential for uh, a person say standing at uh, load 1 or load 2. So, if uh, some person is touching some electrical equipment uh, whether uh, that person would feel a shock when such a uh, fault has happened. So, the first thing we will look at is touch potential without the DG. So, at, uh, at L, L1, this would be the fault current going into the, uh, the fault times your Z of your grounding which is 30 amps into 4 through 120 volts is what would be seen by a person at, uh, at load, uh, load 1. So, so, you have a fault over here and you have a person say touching the frame then because of the resistance between your, uh, your ground wire and the earth electrode, uh, this frame gets elevated with respect to ground. So, the person touching it would see a shock of about 120 uh, volts. If you have another person now at a second location uh, touching this particular frame with respect to the local earth over there, there is no uh, current flowing in uh, in which uh, so, so the person would not see a shock at load 2. So, so next we could look at what happens when the DG is there. Uh, we saw that uh, when the DG is there, there is actually a, a, in, in a sl small increase in current that flows through the fault. So, with D G so it is the same about uh, 120 volts. Uh, now, if you look at at L2, you have about, uh, if you look at the zero sequence current, it was about uh, 30 milliamps into 12 ohms is what is flowing through the, into the ground at uh, uh, load 2 when you had the DG. So, if you get about 0 0.5 volts uh, at uh, the second location. So, you would hardly feel it. Okay, this is slight increase in potential, but not much. So the next question is to consider, uh, say, the situation where because of the fault in load one, if uh, breaker uh, CB one opened, then what would be the uh, current flowing through, uh, 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 I mean if, uh, if you want to see whether CB1 would open, you want to look at the current flowing through uh, switch uh, S1, uh, considering the fact that uh, you have, uh, 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 
So, the question is what is the current flowing through the fault after C B 1 opens ok. So, what is the change in fault current and what is the effect of considering the parasitic capacitance of the of the line where when you are doing such a calculation ok. So, if you look at uh, the parasitic capacitance it is 2 microfarad. So, your x c is 1 by uh, 2 microfarads to 2 pi 50 this is 1592 ohms. So, if you are modeling it you could model it as a as a y connected uh, capacitors uh, of reactants uh, 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 1592 capacitive reactants 1592 ohms between each line to ground ok. So, in your sequence diagram for the single line to ground fault after the circuit breaker opens. So, you have now your positive sequence which is your negative sequence. So, you can calculate your uh, your uh, your fault current uh, level with the capacit uh, parasitic capacitance and that would be two forty volts divided by 12 plus uh, if you look at uh, the effective uh, circuit that is going to be limiting the current here you have uh, 86 milli ohms in parallel with uh, 1592 ohms. So, it is practically just 86 milli ohms here again you have 86 parallel 1592 practically it is 86 and then if you look at the 86 in 
uh, series with numbers like 4500 and 1592, you have to consider just 1592 and the parallel combination of those two network. So, you would have So, you get a magnitude of uh, your fault current to be about 0.48 amps, about half an amp would flow through uh, the fault point. Uh, whereas, if you look at uh, if uh, x c is ignored, your magnitude of your fault current is about 160 milliamps. So, you can see that uh, uh, there is a, a substantial uh, difference in the fault current, uh, especially if you have a ground fault uh, measurement device on your, uh, on your equipment. Uh, if you neglect the parasitic capacitance, you would see you would expect a smaller current, but because of the parasitic capacitance, the actual current would be uh, higher typically be higher, especially when you have high uh, resistance grounding. So, that is when your unbalance really shows up as unbalanced currents uh, flowing through your parasitic capacitors. So, uh, some of these levels can actually be used to set how sensitive your ground fault uh, trip devices, uh, ground, uh, ground fault, uh, fault current interrupting devices to what level of sensitivity you need to set them. So, the next problem is uh, to look at. Uh, so, after a circuit breaker opened, uh, what would be the subsequent voltage seen on a uh, conductor to on a conductor to ground basis. If you look at the sequence network that we previously had, so you could then look at what would be the voltage across the each of your sequence uh, uh, network uh, points. So, you have uh, uh, two forty volts minus uh, the drop is J eighty six. 86 milli ohms into 0.48 amps, which is the uh, uh, fault current level uh, divided by 3. Uh, so, this would be your uh, uh, current flowing through that particular network. So, this is roughly equal to 240 volts. So, I A plus is roughly 240 volts. If you look at V A minus, this is uh, the voltage. Uh, across these two points because of the uh, uh, 0.48 amps fault current that is flowing and you can see that 0.48 amps will cause a very small drop across the negative sequence network. So, this is roughly equal to 0 and V A uh, 0 is roughly equal to uh, minus 240 volts because the voltage drop along that loop has to add up to uh, 0. So, if you look at your voltage, the voltage on which your uh, fault has occurred that drops to 0 and V B is approximately your line to line voltage and V C is also having a magnitude of your line to line voltage on a conductor to ground basis.
So, the next question is uh, what type of uh, relay can be used to actually uh, detect the fault currents and uh, respond in, uh, uh, in uh, to operate under such a condition. So, uh, so, if you look at the fault current level, we saw that the fault current level is uh, of the order of 30 amps. Uh, of the order of 30 amps uh, when uh, the fault occurred in load 1 and if you look at the rating of CB1 is uh, it is uh, 1 MVA divided by uh, root 3 into 415. So, you are talking of something of the order of 1400 amps. So, it would definitely not trip under overcurrent. So, if you want to trip uh, uh, in such a situation, you would need a, a device which actually measures uh, residual currents and uh, trips in response to that. So, if you look at the ideal situation, it may not be that uh, C B 1 has to open in response to a fault in load 1. A, a better situation might be that you want to open C the particular load at which the fault occurred. So, C B 2 should open in response to uh, a fault in load 2. Again, it depends on whether C B 2 has the ability to measure residual currents. If you have C B 2 load corresponding to a power level of, uh, of the order of uh, uh, 10 kVA, then you might have circuit breakers which are rated for uh, 15 amps and a 30 amp uh, short circuit current might cause a 15 amp breaker to trip maybe in a, a few cycles not on an instantaneous basis. But if you have load uh, L 1 which is now uh, uh, 30 kilowatts or higher then again the current rating of the load would be uh, higher than the fault current level. So, you have a you have a possibility that you might have a load and because you are uh, breaker may not be equipped to measure residual current, you might stay with the fault for a longer duration and cause potentially overheating of conductors etcetera. So, you have to look at what your specific rating is, what your fault current is and ensure that uh, you have protection against overheating or uh, sustained long term uh, uh, operation under faults. So, in the next problem we are looking at uh, uh, distribution system uh, protection and coordination. So, we have uh, uh, system uh, the source at uh, say the substation end and we will look at three devices one is a circuit breaker uh, closer to the substation and then you have a, a recloser. Uh, uh, further downstream and then you have a fuse. You have four buses and you have loads at each individual bus and you are for the protective devices you are given parameters. Uh, for the circuit breaker it is extremely inverse with p equal to 2. You are given at uh, a and b parameters b is the definite time delay that you might expect the pickup current level and the reset time of the circuit breaker. Uh, the recloser over here uh, uh, has been considered uh, uh, to include two aspects. One is the recloser might have its own intrinsic uh, uh, circuit breaker uh, type of operation programmed into its uh, uh, whether its relay action, and also it has uh, 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 on and off durations. Uh, as soon as a fault occurs, it stays on for 100 milliseconds then it shuts off, then it recloses for a duration of T C 1, then it shuts off again for 6 seconds, then it recloses again for a duration of T C 2 and looks at whether the fault has cleared by that particular duration of time. So, this is a 2 reclose cycle recloser. It also has an underlying circuit breaker C B R 
with A, B and P values as given with the pickup current and the reset time. Uh, for the fuse you are given a uh, uh, melting current level of 105 amps uh, I square T with some tolerance or range around the nominal and uh, minimum melt time of 100 milliseconds. So, that could be considered as its definite time delay. You are also given that it takes 90 seconds for the fuse to cool down after uh, it uh, gets heated up. You are told that uh, uh, upstream of bus 3. So, the conductors in uh, the region between bus 1 and 2 and 2 and 3 has a I square T level uh, of 30 mega ampere square second and the bus downstream of uh, uh, between 3 and 4 has a I square T of 7.5 mega ampere square second. So, that could be used to determine the settings of uh, the components uh, to see whether you are adequately protect, protected. You are also given the load current level. So, the load at uh, bus 1 is 50 amps at bus 2 is 60 amps and 3 and 4 it is 70 amps each and uh, based on the parameters of the circuit uh, someone has done say a fault study and found out what the maximum uh, the typical maximum uh, level of fault current is, the minimum might correspond to some particular fault configuration it could be a single line to ground fault with some uh, grounding impedances etcetera. So, you are given a fault current range to ex that could be expected at each of those uh, buses. So, the problem uh, is first to plot the, the trip time of the protection device versus current of uh, the circuit breaker, the circuit breaker at the street closer and for the fuse uh, in a range from uh, 100 amps to uh, uh, 10 kilo amps. So, to do that we have to look at the parameters of, uh, uh, of the, uh, of the uh, protective devices. So, for the CB, If the current is greater than the pickup current level of the circuit breaker, which is 300 amps, you have your trip time or uh, else when it is lesser than 300 amps. Uh, during reset your T reset is 20 by and what we will take is uh, if your nominal current is much lesser than uh, 300 amps this is uh, we can take it as just 20 seconds. the pickup current. Uh, if you look at the particular uh, uh, breaker, if you look at the total load that comes in from uh, load 2, load 3, load 4 at this particular breaker that adds up to about 200 amps. Uh, so, if you look at at that particular point your reset time is of the order of uh, 36 seconds, but uh, we will assume that the reset time is uh, constant va value of about 20 seconds. So, next for the CBR,
So, so and finally for the fuse. So for the nominal fuse, we have uh, for current greater than the melt current. your I square T is A I melt square. So, you can evaluate what your equivalent A is and this is for the nominal uh, fuse 2 into the 10 power of 6 divided by So, you could think of it as a equivalent uh, a B C A B P parameters so your T melt as a function of current is plus a definite time of 100 milliseconds. Your cool down time And you could uh, plot this. Uh, so, what is shown over here is uh, the characteristics of the uh, circuit breaker uh, at uh, closer to the substation than the recloser uh, and for the fuse. And you can see that uh, uh, the nature of the characteristic. So, you have uh, almost a flat line. Uh, over here, but then closer to the definite time characteristics, it, uh, it uh, the curve starts flattening out. If you look at the fuse, you have the nominal curve for the fuse and then uh, plus 20 percent I square T or a minus 20 percent I square T. So, it shows up as a band around the nominal curve uh, in the range of uh, interest. If you look at the reset curve, you can see that uh, the reset time also increases as you get closer to the melt time, but for uh, many practical calculations you can take it to be a roughly a constant uh, number. So, the next uh, 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 I, uh, question is to identify the zones of protection of each device and check if the devices are coordinated in the specified current range for the fault, zo fault in the zones that are being considered. So, you can see that the zones that would be considered would be from one protective device uh, up to the next device where the next device would be expected to protect uh, in the zone uh, immediately downstream of that. So, for example, the circuit breaker 1 would protect up to the recloser plus maybe in including a fault at the recloser itself. Uh, then the uh, R would be able to protect up to the fuse including a uh, fault at the fuse itself. Then you would have uh, the fuse protecting uh, up to bus 4 and further downstream of bus 4 would be the uh, whatever load is connected. The load itself would have its own protective devices. It is not mentioned in the problem what it is, but it would have its zone uh, corresponding zone. So, you could identify zone 1, 2, 3, 4 for uh, a system such as this. So, the uh, next question is to check if the protection systems are coordinated. So, what you have to do is uh, uh, you look at uh, your trip curves corresponding to the maximum uh, uh, or the fault current in the ranges. So, for example, for uh, C B 1 it was you are looking at uh, 
3500 amps to 9.2 kilo amps. So, you, are, you might be talking about uh, some current in some range such as this. So, you are looking at, at each range uh, would the would the curve in the zone upstream zone be lying above uh, the curve corresponding to the downstream zone. So, actually plotting these protective characteristics in a time versus current curve gives you a good feel for whether it is uh, coordinated, what the margins are etcetera. So, if you uh, it uh, gives you an overall picture of what the situation is. So, in this particular case for a fault in zone 1, if you look at your fault current level and your trip time of C B, So, for a fault in zone 1 obviously, the only device to protect over there is C B for a fault in zone 2 you can see that in the specified range C B R is much faster than C B. So, you have the adequate uh, coordination. Similarly, you could then go further down. So, if you look at uh, in the range that was being considered like uh, uh, you, you can see that whatever is the range you have suf sufficient clearance between these curves that is essentially what you are looking for. Similarly, you can look for uh, other fault ranges. So, if you are looking at uh, fault in uh, zone 3. So, you are looking at uh, about uh, 1.4 to uh, 2.1. So, again in this range you are looking at now the clearance between your fuse and your CBR and again you can see that even with the tolerance you have adequate clearance between the fuse and CBR. So, you have adequate coordination between your C B, C B R and the fuse. So, overall they, they are reasonably well coordinated. Okay. So, the next question is uh, would the uh, would these devices give adequate uh, backup protection. So, what you could consider is if for some reason uh, R fails would C B provide backup protection in the sense that uh, uh, would zone 1 itself be protected when R fails and would zone uh, 2 also get some degree of protection or would is there a possibility that faults over here can propagate over to uh, zone 1. Okay. Similarly, if for some reason fuse uh, fails to melt uh, and then would R provide backup protection to uh, zone 3. 
So, if you look at uh, fault in zone 2 and failure of uh, CBR, then you uh, the, the device that is providing backup protection is CB. So, you could look at the maximum uh, fault current level in uh, for a fault in zone 2 is 3.5 and the minimum is 2 and you could look at what would be the trip time of uh, circuit breaker for that particular level of fault then look at what the I squared T level would be and you can see that this is now less than the 30 m mega ampere square second for the contactors of uh, zone 1 and zone 2. So, you can see that uh, uh, the fault in this region and the failure of one particular device to operate is being backed up by a upstream device and not just that the fault will not propagate to zone uh, 1, zone 2 itself is entirely protected by uh, the CB also uh, in this particular case. So, similarly if you look at uh, the situation where uh, you have a fault in this particular region and, and, uh, uh, and uh, say the fuse F fails to melt, then uh, you can see that uh, uh, the device that would now give you the backup protection is R. So, you could look at the maximum and the minimum uh, fault current for a fault in this particular zone. Uh, look at the trip times of this particular uh, device, protective device and look at your, your uh, I squared T level, corresponding I squared T level and this is now less than uh, 7 uh, mega ampere square second. So, it does provide backup protection for uh, a fault in zone 3 also. You could also look at a, a situation where say suppose you have a fault in zone 4, even though you do not know what is a protective device being used in zone 4, if that device fails to protect would uh, you have backup uh, because of the fuse F1. So, you can look at the maximum and the minimum fault current range and look at what is the I square T level and you could uh, again uh, see that in this particular case the resulting I square T is less than the 7 mega ampere square second for required for this particular zone. So, again uh, you are having uh, complete uh, backup protection in this particular case. The next question is uh, what is the margin available uh, uh, for uh, between the tripping times for uh, uh, between the actual operation of the device and the upstream device. So, if you look at for a fault in zone uh, 2, so a fault in this particular region, if you look at uh, the tripping times of uh, the circuit breaker, it is about 1.89, 5.79 uh, seconds of the uh, CBR is 0.58. So, in terms of time you are having a margin of greater than 1.3 seconds. Uh, similarly, for a fault in zone uh, 3 your trip time of CBR is of the order of 1.56 and 3.49 seconds whereas, the melt time of the fuse is about 0.65 to 1.33 seconds. So, you have a margin of greater than uh, say uh, 4 cycles. So, it is uh, more than a typical instantaneous trip uh, settings of a circuit breaker. So, you have a lesser possibility of some race condition causing a, a upstream device from operating when a downstream device should have operated. So, in the next, uh, in the next class we will look at the question of uh, what are the objectives of the C, uh, coordination between the recloser and the circuit breaker, similarly between the recloser and the fuse and look at the settings calculations and what could be done for coordination and what would happen when uh, DG unit is added to uh, such a system. Thank you.